Good morning. Good morning. Um, the worship committee is hosting an Easter Sunday breakfast in lieu of Sunday school. All are invited to come and join in an Easter morning fellowship and breakfast. Should you wish to bring a dish or pastry to share, sign up on the sign-up sheet on the bulletin board outside uh, of the church office and see uh, Judy Schaefer. Uh, and um, Kathy and Keith, uh, Lajar I don't know how to say their last name, Lajarjans, yes, have been uh, through a lot this week, and uh, we're asking for volunteers for meals for them this week. If you're interested, see Judy Snicker. Um, and um, yesterday was uh, Evelyn Blackstone's birthday. She was 90, and uh, they watch our sermon every week. So I thought maybe we could sing happy birthday to her uh, and to the camera because she'll see it. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure that um, Kathy needs to stay in our prayers. And uh, is there any other prayer requests? Yes. Paul Mooney Jr. with back surgery. Yes. Yes. So prayers for daughter-in-law? Mother. Mother of the daughter-in-law. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. So prayers for oh um, prayers for Roger Hoof and his family. Anybody else? Okay. So please stand for the opening hymn.
You may be seated. You need a mic. They need a mic right now. No. Thanks, Bob. Uh, we've been asked to share a few stories or tales of our mission trip two weeks ago. And uh, the first morning we were there, we met with uh, Jim for the Epworth Project. And he said, when people ask about your mission trip, they really want to know about it. But then as soon as you start talking, they kind of glaze over and quit listening. So, <laughs> so we'll try to keep it short. Um, there were six of nine of us, ten of us all together that went, uh, four from Olive Branch and six from Faith Community. Uh, I was the cook, so I didn't have much on-site activity other than cooking. Uh, but um, <laughs> but I, I won't say a whole lot. I'll let these two share more of the stories of the people that we work with. But uh, we have been in Picayune probably 10, 12, 14 times since we started going south and have built such a relationship up with the folks there that they – buy us food for our lunches, they come and join us for meals, and um, we're just blessed to have that opportunity. It's such a wonderful facility to stay in. So I'll turn it over to Michelle and Tom. Um, Judy did a great job for us all week long. Um, she would get up in the morning, she'd make us breakfast, she'd have coffee going. Um, the best part was we had pies in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they weren't burnt like <laughs> They were the best, but I, th I think I'll start out a little bit with when we we went, we got down there Saturday night, um, and then Sunday we went to church there in town, and then was it Monday morning we went for orientation, and um, Jim was who we met with, um, when, we, when we drove in, <laughs> try not to, <laughs> when we drove in, there was trailer on the side of the parking lot, and um, said, it was Colossians 3.17, it says, whatever you do, do in the name of the Lord, give thanks. And so I thought, that's what this week is about, and, uh, and, helping, and helping others. But what really hit me was um, when he talked about the people, um, you know, we go down and we're just a group of 10, and you wonder if you're going to make a difference, but he said that there were 900 people still on the waiting list to have help. So he was telling us that, and when you drive through Picayune and Slidell areas, you see the poverty. It's just, it, you know, around here we have neighborhoods, and we know that you know, this, this neighborhood's a little rough, but we've got our nice neighborhoods. But down there, you're just driving, and you're just seeing poverty and poverty and poverty. And then you see this big, beautiful house, and then poverty and poverty. And he said that the community down there, they had, they, they talk about them being two, two different groups of people. The haves, this is the haves. The have-nots are this. And so we visited two, we spent time at two people's houses that week. Um, one was Miss Diane's house. She was a widow living in a house. Um, at that house. started because we were in there to finish the job, so it was really just tearing up the entire kitchen floor and keeping it clean and clear. And she was Mitchell sitting in the middle of the kitchen on the dirt floor, and then we had Lord Joyce in there with her and just her lighting the wood mm -hmm. and the lamp and the lights and all that. So putting all the new Lord Joyce in and the new plywood in and getting ready for that. And I think throughout the week we probably got you know maybe a pile ready to a pile in the kitchen for the three weeks there we were there but we had maybe a lot of pouring and then the kitchen the cabinet was just falling apart and we needed to look yeah we finished they did finish the flooring okay. in the kitchen yeah, Tom and Michelle had to leave Thursday morning because they weren't there to see the finished product but we finished the flooring in the kitchen and put new laminate flooring in the living room and then left her money to buy new cabinets 
he had, um, when he walked into the kitchen floor, um, he had to kind of tiptoe in places because it was so weak. Even with the tile on it, um, it was so weak he knew he was going to fall. Um, at one point, he had to stand on the two by fours and then put it to the side by the door as they were trying to get the tile up. And as they were prying the tile up, I was like, <gasps> I thought I was going to go through the floor. Um, but, and then her cabinets, she had, she had a little bit of funds to help with the flooring, but she had plywood floors and no, no flooring on the floor. And the, she had said, she had mentioned to me, she said, yeah, eventually I want to get cabinets. And I looked at them and you can sometimes paint cabinets and really turn them around and make them look nice. And I thought, I'll just see if they're in good working order. We'll surprise her and paint the cabinets. And as I'm opening the drawer where the silverware would go, there's no bottom mm. to the drawer. And this, this lazy Susan was all wonky. And, and it, you could just see the, it was so wet down there, so moist down there. Just, um, she wasn't necessarily in the hurricane um, damp, the winds, really, but she didn't get water damage like in her house. But it just, the help and the funds um, to be able to get that work done just wasn't there because she was working. And then the second place we went to was Miss Delala. And she was in a totally different, she, that was a totally different scenario. Miss Diane had some funds to kind of help her house get on. But Miss Delala's was, you'll see, I think, when she's standing in front of it, was the killer. Uh, it had walls about that thick with no insulation. She had told me, I'd asked her, I said, how cold does it get down here in the well, we had a really cold winter. I said it got down in the 20s, and there was no evidence of heat. Um, her ceilings, you'll see in the pictures, um, there was no ceiling. She had insulation hanging down. She was probably in her 70s, and she had two sets of bunk beds in these bedrooms because she was the only one that had grandchildren. And... Um, it needed a front door replaced. The front door was the front door was the easy one. The back door. Okay, this door is falling apart. Maybe we need to rip it out. But she had to fix the floor, so hmm. there really wasn't anything to flip the door to. I mean, floor joists were rotted out. Part of the other group, Mitchell, was fixing the door in. Literally, you had to fix. Walk in, you've got a toilet, um, no vanity. You were able to put a vanity in, um, but the water lines to the showers were out. So we had to put the water lines. We, while we were there, we didn't have any water lines. Um, so it didn't get any further showering. We couldn't really even shower because the house didn't have hot water to help the shower. Um, so the cold water line. Tom was able to go in and fix it. Um, Mr. Mr. Tom, there was a Mr. Tom that worked down there, but he was the guy that brought the supplies to the job site. He said, you need some extra nails. We could really use some two by fours for this. He would go and run, and they, whether it was Home Depot or sometimes they have a warehouse here, how they would store extra materials in the warehouse. Tom was able to go in the bathroom and say, well, we need this and this. And she had no vanity. You know, brush your teeth and wash your hands like we did. But the shower was not there. She had her kitchen sink. Um, but the back door they worked on was so bad. Was so bad that there was no pry wall that was studs exposed back in that half of the trailer that she had a rope that she would take through a hole in the wall the cutouts where a doorknob should be and tie it with a rope the back door I don't think you understand how the way we, you know you think we went pretty decently around here and then we go to situations like that and you don't realize how much of the world is living in situations like that 
But I might add that Miss Diane was such a gracious lady that Wednesday she provided lunch for us. She fixed ribs, chicken, mac and cheese, uh, baked beans, coleslaw, no, potato salad, green beans, yeah, peas, peas, yeah. So, but here she is, cheese for your catering. It was just a great week, and um, I don't know if we'll go back south in the future, but we hope to get a relationship back with those girls because they want us to come back. They miss us a lot. Nothing is worse than missing a girl. So we had a lot to go. And Mitchell was great. He uh, had his service dog with him. Uh, Ellie was a good, good entertainment, quite yeah. often. So we are blessed. And thank you all for supporting and helping us make it happen. Thank you. reading Luke 19 20 uh, 28 through 44 after Jesus had said this he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem as he approached the Beth Beth Burnage and and Bethany on the hill called the Mount of Olives he sent two of his disciples saying to them go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it 
you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If no one, if anyone asks you why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. <clears throat> When he came near the when he came near the place where the road road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of dis, of disciples began in joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had said they had seen. Blessed is the King who came in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory of in the highest, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your, your disciples. I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it and said, If you even, if you, even you had only known on this day that would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in, in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within the, your walls. They will not leave you leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to us, to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Good morning. I cannot believe it's Palm Sunday. It's, it's Easter time. I mean, were we just not at Christmas? And here we are. Today, um, we are going to talk about some things, as you see that the timing is, the title is Psalms, Donkeys, and Rocks. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to stop for a word of prayer. Father, I ask that you be among us today. Open our eyes and our ears that we hear your word. Calm our spirits so that we rest in you. Minister to us as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. So palms, we have these beautiful palm branches, and we got to wave them today. And when I think about palms, palm trees, Florida, Hawaii, you know, those places we wish that we were <laughs> instead of Ohio, when we never know what we're supposed to wear each day, whether a coat or shorts, who knows, flip-flops, yeah, whatever. But there, it is a time. It is something that we see as a, a happy thing, a good thing, and in um, scriptural time, biblical time, the palms were seen as a symbol of beauty and prosperity, and Jericho was actually known as the city of palms because it was like an oasis in the middle of this dry desert, this area where there were palm trees meant there was water, which meant there was prosperity, which meant that there would be crops and all that good stuff. It was an oasis in the middle of the desert. And often they would use, and, and I bet today if you go into different places and you look at stained glass and different art, you will see images of palms that were used in the decoration of the temples. That's, that's what they did. And then we have donkeys. Now, our farm had, was a working farm. We had between 80 to 120 head of uh, black Angus, beautiful, beautiful cattle. And so we had Jack the donkey. Now, I did not really understand the significance of a donkey being with the cattle, but buddy Jack did his job. 
And down there in the mountain, when he would do his braying, it would echo. You knew something was up. Donkeys are great at protecting the cattle and the herds and, and alarming you that something is going on. And did you know that donkeys appear in Scripture over 120 times? And many of you are probably familiar with the story of Balaam's donkey, who actually talked because Balaam's trying to get the donkey to do something. And finally, the donkey's like, dude, stop, right? It's a great story. It's in your Bible. Don't tell me the Bible's boring. The donkey talks in the Bible. It's great. The donkey is also known as the beast of burden. And riding animals was only for people of nobility and leaders and all of those good things. Donkeys were prophesied about how this would all happen with Jesus back in the Old Testament, in Zechariah 9.9. And it also talks about the fact that this, these donkeys were purebreds. They were not mixed. They were purebred donkeys. This was interesting, too. Did you know that when a king rode in on a donkey, it was a symbol of peace? But if they rode in on a horse... It was a time of war. So this we have, this picture of Christ coming in on a donkey. Then we get to the rocks. Now you're going to laugh about this. I talk a lot about Howie because I wish you all could have known Howie. He was something else. But he, from our farm in Carolina, brought back a huge box of rocks. Now they're beautiful because they're from the mountains. Some were from the New River, if any of you have been whitewater rafting. That new river went around all the back of our farm. And the rocks in the mountains are beautiful. And so I have a box of rocks. Now, it was wonderful and beautiful till I had to move the rocks. <laughs> That's a lot of work. But they're so beautiful and wonderful. Rocks mean a lot of different things. Uh, in the Bible, we talk a lot about rocks because it's a rocky site, was a place of refuge. God is our rock and the source of protection. We also talk about some of God's titles. He was the stone of Israel, the rock, the rock of salvation. And in Isaiah and Romans, to the unholy people, that this rock was something they would stumble over. Christ was known as our spiritual rock. So we talk, we have these three symbols today in our scripture. And you want to know what's really awesome about these three symbols? A palm a donkey, a rock, is that God, who makes all things, can take something ordinary and make it great and make it do things. And I'm telling you, people, we could say amen and leave right there because if God, the creator, can take the donkey, the rock, the palm, and make them do great things, he can do the same thing for things in your life. In your life, the ordinary the problems that you are facing, God can change it. We need to have that hope today. As we look at the text, we talk about this is Palm Sunday. And so here we have Jesus. We've been talking about Jesus moving toward his purpose, going to the Christ, he, or to the cross, because he's paying the price to reunify people back to their God for the sins that they had committed. And so Jesus laid aside his deity, remained God, became fully human, and walked this earth with us. So he's on his way. He's performed all these miracles. All of these things have happened. He's raised people from the dead. He's healed the sick. He's just been amazing. And all the people are witnessing this. They're seeing this. And he's telling them, hey, blah, blah, blah. He's telling this. But they didn't really hear they didn't really understand. So as we get closer to the time, they're all heading to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Jesus says, since two of his disciples ahead to this village. Why two disciples? It was custom in those days to always send two messengers. And you think about it, it's witness. You have to have two or three. And wherever two or three are gathered, we know that God is there. Two people. So he sends two disciples ahead. And then Jesus tells them plainly, I want you to go to the village. When you enter it, you're going to find a colt tied there, which is a, a donkey that's pure. No one has ever ridden it 
untie it, bring it here. If anybody asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Now, back in that day, if somebody walked on your place and started taking your horse, I don't think you would say, what are you doing? You'd be like, 911, they're taking my horse, right? But back in that day, it was a custom that they would share their animals if it was something important for royalty or someone in leadership. So Jesus had told the disciples, get ready for this. Now, how did he know that? Because he's God, right? Because what happened? When they got into the village, they went over there, they found the colt just as he said, and as they were untying it, the owner said, why are you untying the colt? And they replied what Jesus told them, because the Lord needs it. And that's it. Isn't that amazing? God knows all things. He tells us. He tries to help us to, to how to react and how to walk through. The, he's got it under control. We don't need to panic. But we do because we're human. So they take the, the donkey back to Jesus. They throw cloaks over it, which would be their outer cloaks. And this was a sign of honor for those in leadership. And they take it, Jesus gets upon it, and they start moving toward the Mount of Olives. And as they are going down, the people see this Jesus, this guy that they think is their king. Now, what they thought was that Jesus was going to come and be the king at that moment and take over the place and rule it. They would have no more enemies. They would be a unified nation under this king. They had no idea the greater story that was unfolding. Even though Jesus kept telling them, did he not? Multiple times in scripture, he kept telling them, this is what's going to happen. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when he tells the one disciples, you know, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. Oh, no, you're not. No one's going to but I have to. Oh, no, I'm not going to let that happen. Have you ever tried to talk to someone? It's like talking to a brick wall, and they don't hear you, and they're just rattle-trapping away, and you're going, but, but. I imagine that's how the Lord began to feel. So as they're coming down, Jesus is on this donkey, and the people start shouting, Hosanna, which means save us, because they're treating him as a, as a king. He's their king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. And they're worshiping him, and it's all great and wonderful. And then you got the religious Pharisees. And they're standing over there, and they say to Jesus, you rebuke your disciples. He's telling them, these Pharisees are telling Jesus to tell your disciples to stop praising you. Stop praising you. Because that's blasphemous. Don't do that. This is great what Jesus said. I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Whew. Now listen, people. Every Sunday we have opportunity for prayers and praises. And we are not giving praises. And I can tell you that everyone in this room has something to give praise to God for this morning. Amen? You are here. You are walking. You are able to be here. God has brought you through how many things in your life. And if we don't watch it and we stop praising God, the rocks are going to cry out. So that box of howies is going to get really noisy if I don't keep running my mouth. We need to give our praise to God. We have fallen short. Why would anyone want to be part of a church when all we talk about is the dread and dreary? We need to give our praises. And Jesus makes it clear, I tell you, if these people keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Oh, that we would not even think about not giving praise for what God has done for us. Then what happens next? As Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he wept over the city. Many people try to say that Jesus wept because he didn't want to die, that he didn't want to suffer, that he didn't want to. I, I can't say that because I don't know. But I do know this. Jesus did say, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. 
He was weeping that the people didn't get it. He was weeping that the people did not understand that he was there. He had come for them. He was their eternal king, not the temporary king, the eternal king. And they didn't get it. And that broke his heart. Are we breaking his heart today? Are we getting it? This story is so much greater than what we fathom. The glory that we are in right now with Christ is nothing compared to the glory that is yet to come. This is where we must remember that we need to look, even though you're walking through horrible things. Some of you have been in a holding pattern for quite some time. You're facing the same problem over and over like Groundhog Day, right? And it stinks. Give you praise anyway. Because guess what? The glory yet to come is what we have to look forward to. Now, I want to caution you. I grew up in a church that all they talked about is, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven. And that's a wonderful thing to hold on to. But heaven is here now because the kingdom of God is within us. God is within us right now. We should be celebrating and loving the fact that God has chosen us, living within us. And yes, heaven is yet to come. And so when we go through trials, we know that we have God who is with us. And also what a great party it's going to be when we get to heaven. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. You see, Jesus was brokenhearted. Is he weeping over us? Do we truly see that God has come for us in what he has done? Do we walk through this time of Easter as like, oh yeah, Jesus went to the cross, he died, and then he resurrected, okay. Or do we truly understand the significance that we have a God who loved us so much, he gave his all. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may your words prompt us to look for you. Give us your strength, Lord. Help us to remember what you have done for us. Help us to reflect on how you are with us every day in our lives. Help us to rejoice for the kingdom that is within us and help us to have the hope that only you can give. Continue to move with us throughout this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Now if our ushers will come for our offering. To receive these gifts back that you have given us and we return to you to use for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Union ushers will come forward. Please hold your elements. We'll be taking a communion together in the pew. In 1 Corinthians, we read, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, God, for who you are, for your work in creation, your providence, your deliverance, your covenant of love for us, and for the giving of this bread and this wine. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to us as the true bread of life. Thank you, God, for the person and work of Jesus Christ in accomplishing our salvation and for instituting this sacred meal as a remembrance of his passion, death, and resurrection, through which our salvation has been secured. Holy Spirit, bless these gifts of bread and wine that they may bless us. May we be transformed by your presence and be transformed people of God in this world. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you.
the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord a bliss to bear? the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I frown. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on I'll sing on, and when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, and when from death I'll free, I'll sing and joyful be, and through eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on. Uh...
to God and to the Lamb, I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb, who is so great I am, while millions join the dismissed in reflective silence. Amen.